Hi, I'm Dr. Nick Bird, CEO and Chief Medical Officer for the Divers Alert Network. My talk today is on medications and diving. Our objectives today are to establish a thoughtful approach to the medical evaluation of divers who take medications and to provide a systems-based approach to medical fitness assessments. The last objective is to highlight medicines and diseases and processes that are, are of particular concern to medical fitness evaluations. Our topic today starts with a question, and the question is, can I dive safely on this medication? And where do these medications fit, though, into the context of a diving evaluation? So before we begin talking about medications specifically, it's good to set a context for where they fit in general. So let us begin with the patient. From there, we have the physical fitness of that individual. We have their medical fitness, meaning how healthy are they? We have their motivation and reason for diving. Many people get into diving for lots of reasons, but why they're doing the particular diving they're doing is very important. We also have the environment. So what is safe today as a place to go diving may not be safe tomorrow simply because environmental factors change. We have the type of diving they're doing. So what is safe for one diver in one particular environment may not be safe for another because of the types of diving they're doing. Examples might be sort of shallow recreational diving versus deep technical or rec or cave diving. We then have their training and experience. So how does that person's skill level match with what they're doing. Next, we have their psychological status. So be beyond their motivation, do they have any underlying medical conditions that are of concern to us when we talk about their psychological approach to diving and why they're doing it? And last but not least, we have medications. So although this talk today is going to be on medications and diving, it's important to recognize that medications as an issue within diving medicine fit within a context and a family of lots of other issues. So what does the data tell us about diving fatalities? Before we get into medications and diving, I'd like to set a context for what actually harms divers. So where do divers come into problems? Where do they die? So what are the statistics? What does the data tell us? Well, based upon data dating back to the 1970s, there was about an annual rate of 100 to 150 fatalities a year in North America. The good news is, is that that rate has declined. Rates in the last 20 to 30 years have actually averaged around 85 or so fatalities a year. In 2010, the Divers Alert Network hosted a fatalities workshop here in Durham, North Carolina. During that three-day workshop, we had representatives from across the diving industry, from dive leaders, training organizations, and healthcare professionals, to discuss issues that affect divers. If you're interested in looking at those proceedings online, you can go to the DAN website at www.dan.org and click on the Fatality Workshop icon. Some of the data that was presented at that workshop talked about data gathered from about 2000 to 2006, and we used as a denominator the number of insured divers. This is an important piece of information because most of the data that's out there is very difficult to relate to a known baseline number of divers. So with looking at insured people, we knew what that number was. And we looked at baseline number of insured people and then the number of insurance claims. The results of that study were that out of 187 diving deaths, the rate of fatalities based upon claims was about 16 per 100,000 insured members. And these rates were actually very consistent with the British Subaqua Club's data as well during that same period. So our data was very consistent to other centers who were keeping very similar information. So, the scuba deaths among insured diving members looked at uh, primary causes, and one of the main ones was underlying cardiac disease. We also looked at the fact that age-related trends in diving deaths reflect 
similar trends in the non-diving population, which supports the idea that diving per se does not seem to be an independent contributor to those fatalities. And last, and this is an important point, age itself does not appear to be a causative factor, but more research is necessary so that we understand the effects of aging and diving. But it is less the age itself than it is the underlying health of the individual. When we look at graphs based upon fatality statistics, men versus women, the fatality statistics with diving are actually very similar to the fatality statistics in the world when you relate men to women. And those two genders start to collide at around the age of 60 to 65, somewhere after normal menopause. Interestingly enough as well, causes of cardiac fatalities, meaning heart, are also very similar to the general population with peak rates hitting at around the age of 50 or so. When we look at primary causes of diving fatalities, the lion's share fall into the column of drowning, and that accounts for about 70%. The other two main contributors are arterial gas embolism and underlying cardiac disease. Now, in fairness, it should be said that that 70% is a little bit of a misnomer because most of the fatalities that happen will, will also be associated with drowning but drowning is the end point, not necessarily the beginning part of the cascade that caused it. So when we dial back and we look at triggers, the things that ultimately lead to a bad outcome, they rank out as such. So we have about 41% die from insufficient gas. That means running out of air, everybody. 41%, that's a really high number. Next we have entrapment, meaning people are trapped and they can't get out. That's about 20%. And we have 15% of divers have equipment problems. Some of us might argue that it's not necessarily the equipment that is the problem, but the divers trouble with the equipment that they have. Disabling injuries fall out in the following ranking order. Asphyxia, meaning being out of breath, is 33. 29% are arterial gas embolism, and 26% are underlying cardiac causes. When I look at this, I look at almost all of these issues, except for underlying cardiac disease, are really operator dependent, meaning that the diver, him or herself, is very, very responsible for almost all of these issues, except for underlying health issues. The reason I create this context is to underscore the fact that medications aren't anywhere on this list. So medications per se actually play a very small independent role when it comes to overall diving fatality statistics. So let's look at some of the, the resources that you have available if you're interested in researching this topic. So let's start first with the patient. And where does that patient go to try to get information about themselves? Well, the first place they might go is to a diving physician. That diving physician or that individual patient may go to a specialist or information resource. From there, you might talk about medications, their goals for diving, and how their level of fitness relates to the types of diving they want to do, and then their underlying medical history. Where can we go to find information about this interesting topic? Well, there are lots of sources on the web to include the DAN website. Individuals would also be directed towards the Undersea and Hyperbaric Medicine Society website, Rubicon, Scuba Med, Scuba Doc, and Doc Vikingo. At the end of the day, there is not a whole lot of research on this topic, and expert opinion really is far more prominently represented than prospective research. As a result, our approach is thoughtful as opposed to absolutely from a hard research perspective, and our goal is to minimize risk. A study that I really enjoy is a survey of 709 respondents, 346 of whom were from Australia, 363 were from the US. These were all active divers on chronic medications. And the survey was looking at how those medications impacted divers. 
The conclusion statements from that survey were the following. Medications are likely to be markers of chronic medical conditions with which the divers dive. These conditions may impact adversely on divers' fitness to dive. They went on to say that while the hyperbaric environment, meaning a high-pressure environment that we experience as divers, may modulate the effects of these medications, of far greater importance is the impact of the underlying medical condition on a diver's medical fitness to dive. So there we have it again that their underlying medical condition is far more important than the medications themselves in almost all cases. So let us go back to our original question, which was, can I dive safely on this medication? But I think there's even a deeper question. And the real question is the following. Is there anything about my medical condition that should prevent me from diving today? And I underscore today because your medical condition may relate to the diving environment that you're going to differently day by day. So somebody may have a medical condition that enables them to dive, say, in a calm environment, whereas going in that same environment on a different day where there are currents and bigger swells, it may not be a good idea. So the underlying medical condition, as we've said before, is more likely to exclude people from the diving experience than the medication itself. When you are exposed or when you go to a diving physician, you will find, as in all walks of life, a particular bias towards inclusion, i.e. allowing you to dive or feeling more comfortable with you diving, or exclusion, meaning the diving physician may not feel very comfortable with you diving with your particular medical condition. So let us look at how physicians commonly look at medications and how they are a window, oftentimes, into the medical conditions for which they're used to treat. We'll start with a case of a patient who presents with tingling feet. This person's 56-year-old female. She's a little short for her weight, and her blood pressure's a little elevated. The medications she's on are lisinopril, which is for blood pressure, atenolol, which is also for blood pressure, aspirin, atorvastatin, which is for cholesterol, sertraline, which is for anxiety and depression issues, and last, metformin, which is for diabetes. So these medications all by themselves give a physician a great window into the underlying or the likely underlying medical conditions that affect an individual. And so we can intuit quite a bit by looking at a medication list, but it's not the place to stop. It's really just an entry point into the medical history of an individual. So Dan Medicine receives a lot of calls and a lot of emails. As you can see here, we get about 12 to 15,000 calls and emails a year and about 1,500 to 2,500 calls to our emergency hotline, which keeps us pretty busy. One of the most frequent calls and questions that we get relates to medications and diving. And in almost every one of these conversations, the underlying medical condition for which the medication is being used or prescribed is often underappreciated. Some of the questions that we also ask include, how long have you been on this medication? On the whole, if people are on medications for a prolonged period of time and they're very well controlled and they understand the side effects or don't have any side effects, oftentimes these medications are going to be just fine for diving. Having the counter to that is someone who is just on a medication or just started taking one yesterday and wants to dive. Commonly, we recommend about 30 days on a medication to be sure that if there are going to be any side effects, we're well aware of what those are and they're well controlled. Another key piece of information relates to the number of physicians who are prescribing for that individual and does any one physician know all of the medications that are in a patient's uh, pile of medications. Additional concerns involve the potential impact of side effects on judgment and physical ability. And obvious medications in this group would include things like sedatives or things called anxiolytics, which help to knock down anxiety. So these are the things like the Valiums of the world or the Xanaxes of the world that 
are used for anxiety. Also big key players in this group would be narcotic pain medications, an example of which might be morphine. All of these medications tend to minimize our ability to problem solve and make good decisions. A common question that we also get involves the additive effect of nitrogen narcosis. My takeaway point on this is that if you're on a medication like a narcotic and you're considering diving to a depth where nitrogen narcosis is going to play a role, it's probably not good to add those two together. It's probably best not to dive at all, but if nitrogen narcosis is a big concern, that should be a big red flag that the medication for which you're on is not a good medication for you to be diving with. So I'm going to now go through a, syst a body system approach to medications so that you can get a sense per body system of how we evaluate your medical fitness relative to diving. I'm going to start with the musculoskeletal system. A big issue here is pain and whether or not pain limits your mobility. Next is your function. Does pain limit your mobility and or function? So if I can move, that's great. If I can't move, that's function. And might those symptoms cause diagnostic confusion? As if, for instance, if you have a little bit of elbow or shoulder pain, but after the dive, your pain's a lot worse, it becomes more challenging to figure out whether or not that's from decompression sickness or a worsening of your underlying musculoskeletal concerns. Another key issue is whether or not diving may exacerbate or make worse your underlying condition. An example might be knee or ankle injury where finning can cause more pain and disability in those areas in the short term. And of course, if people are in enough pain and they're on narcotic medication, well, we've already kind of talked about that, but narcotic medication and diving really usually doesn't mix and we don't tend to recommend it. A final point on this is a medication class that is commonly used for musculoskeletal complaints which are the non-steroidal anti-inflammatory drugs of which medications like ibuprofen or Motrin or Aleve or Naprosyn are members. These medications also can cause a higher risk of bleeding as they restrict the activities of platelets. So that adds a little bit of spice to the mix with respect to potential injuries like middle ear barotrauma. Moving on, let us talk about the neurological system. The neurological system, of course, is our nervous system, which involves the brain, spinal cord, and peripheral nerves. If that, air, if that system is impacted, affected, or injured, it may impact a diver's ability to swim or take care of themselves. The other key question is whether or not these symptoms are new or whether they've happened just after the dive. It's also very important to figure out whether someone's ever had a history of seizures or recurrent migraines, or the medications that they're using to control some of these issues are giving them side effects. A take-home message on seizures and diving is this is an area of unanimous agreement among diving medicine specialists. People who have an underlying seizure disorder or are prone to seizures, we don't recommend diving. And the reason for that is that seizures would lead to fatality in almost all cases. So the risk just isn't worth it. Let us next talk about the endocrine system. The endocrine system are a series of glands which secrete hormones. And hormones within the body are a way for one part of the body to communicate or direct another. An example of this is the release of insulin in a diabetic. We would say in all endocrine issues that gross or unstable disorders are contraindications or are reasons not to go diving until they're under good control. For those of you who are interested in further reading, because this is a large topic, the Divers Alert Network published guidelines in 2005 that have enabled diabetics to safely dive and also admit to diving and not hide it. But it also gives very strict guidelines so that they can do it safely. Next is the gastrointestinal system. This is the stomach and intestinal system. Many people take antacids, and antacids are very safe for diving. 
However, if people have an infection like gastroenteritis, which is nausea and vomiting and diarrhea, or you're feeling pretty miserable, this is usually not consistent with safe or happy diving experiences, and we generally recommend postponing your diving activities until your illness is complete. Some people will have ostomies, an example of which is a colostomy, which is a bag that attaches their intestine to the outside world. These are actually safe for diving, so long as they're protected externally, usually with some kind of padding, and all of the air is removed from the bag before diving. A large concern amongst many divers is motion sickness and the medications used to treat it. Common medications are related to antihistamines which cause dry mouth, blurred vision, and fatigue. Most people are pretty comfortable with these side effects, but they're important to understand before you get in the water. Another very commonly used medication is the scopolamine patch, or the transdermal scope. This is a usually well-tolerated medication, but it can also cause dry mouth and some sedation. An important thing to remember is to wash your hands after application, as the medication can cause pupillary dilation, meaning the, eye, the pupils of your eye will dilate and in some people who only rub one eye, this can cause one eye to look big and the other eye to be normal and can cause a lot of concern in emergency room settings. Next, let's talk about the cardiovascular system. This, of course, is the big system, as I said before, that leads to underlying fatalities in about 25% of diving fatality cases. The primary class of medication in this group control blood pressure. One is calcium channel blockers. These can lead to what's called postural hypotension. Hypo, meaning low blood pressure, tension, can happen when people go from a sitting or lying position to a standing position. This is usually a side effect in the early stages of taking a medication, but may occur at other times as well. Usually for diving, these medications are very well tolerated. Next are the ACE inhibitors, which is a very large class of medications, very commonly used, and again, these are considered safe. Next are beta blockers. There's some controversy over the use of beta blockers, as beta blockers affect heart rate. And people who are on high doses or are elite athletes, the reduced heart rate may impede their exercise tolerance or ability to achieve maximal or necessary heart rates when they're really working at it. On the whole, however, most diving is not that stressful, and the heart rates obtainable on beta blockers are usually sufficient for diving safely. Diuretics are a class of medication that cause increased urination, so loss of fluid from the body. Because this can be a little bit annoying, especially if you're a dry suit diver, we generally tend to recommend the use of diuretics after diving. As with all medications in diving, it is important to consult a physician prior to engaging in the activity. When we talk about the cardiovascular system, it's really worthy of a day of communication, if not more. But I am talking about it in the context of a normal structural heart and not with underlying structural abnormalities. As we've said, cardiac related issues can cause 25 to 30 percent of the fatalities attributed to diving, and it's important to consider stress testing and overall fitness when assessing cardiac issues and diving safely. Coumadin is a medication used to thin the blood. It is commonly used with people who have heart arrhythmias or rhythm abnormalities where their blood is more likely to clot within the heart. Coumadin is used safely in most cases. However, it can cause some issues with diving and it's important that divers are aware and have that medication under very good control prior to engaging in any diving activities. The other aspect of this goes to our point about the underlying medical condition. The medication has some concerns because it decreases the ability for the blood to clot, but the underlying medical issue for which it's prescribed, a common one being atrial fibrillation, needs to be controlled prior to safe diving. We've talked about the bleeding risk of aspirin. The bleeding risk on Coumadin is probably a little higher, and middle ear barotrauma 
as well as decompression sickness that might affect the nervous system are two big concerns amongst diving physicians. Whether or not someone is safe to dive on Coumadin really comes down for most of us as a case-by-case -case analysis based upon an individual's diving history and their underlying medical condition. Another medication used for blood thinning is called clopidogrel or Plavix. This is very commonly employed when people have stents placed in their coronary arteries. This is a very powerful medication and we don't usually recommend that people dive while they're on it. On the whole, this medication is used for about six months to a year after stent placement. So we recommend that your heart is stable, you're physically fit, and that you're usually off this medication prior to going diving. The respiratory system gets a lot of attention with diving because we're breathing air or some mixture of gas underwater. Primary underlying medical concern for all of us is the risk of air trapping, which is seen in some inflammatory diseases, asthma being amongst them. To discern whether people with asthma are safe to dive, we commonly recommend a before and after exercise pulmonary function test. This helps to assess the patient's ability to move air in, in and out of their lungs before and after exercise, and it helps to determine whether or not exercise itself is a trigger for airway narrowing. Another common trigger for asthma is cold, dry air. So you can imagine cold, dry air and exercise um, constriction of the airways could be real showstoppers for somebody who was wanting to be an active diver. These can usually be pretty well assessed prior to getting into the water by a pulmonary specialist. However, and this is an important sideline, that despite some of our concerns, the data does not support a big fatality-related or accident-related concern with underlying asthma, as most people who are diving, if they have asthma, have extremely mild asthma, or it's very well controlled. Our next area is the ear, nose, and throat. And this, by far, is probably the largest area of concern amongst divers. On the whole, our underlying advice is to not dive if you have any sign of congestion or are unable to equalize before you get into the water. We also don't recommend the use of decongestants, whether that's a pill or nasal spray, if those medications are the only thing allowing you to equalize and to knock down your congestion. Any of the medications used will cause just like I've said before, some dry mouth, they may cause you to be a little sleepy, some blurred vision, impaired judgment, and maybe even some heart issues. On the whole, we recommend using these medications very sparingly, and certainly, if you are going to use them, only using long-acting, non-drowsy formulations. Sudafed or Sudafedrin is a very, very commonly used medication amongst divers. And Many people have started, and there's been a lot of blog talk on the internet, about the potential concern of Sudafed predisposing to oxygen seizures. At present, there is no data to support this concern, but Dan is actually working on a study as I speak on this particular issue to try to determine whether or not Sudafed may lower people's seizure threshold who are breathing higher partial pressures of oxygen. An interesting study that was done uh, a few years ago on the use of Sudafed also talked about the use in students. And what they found, not surprisingly, is that students who use these medications had fewer problems equalizing during their class. So these medications are used a lot amongst divers, and they're used safely and commonly and our primary guidance, again, is to use long-acting, non-sedating uh, formulations. For those of you who are interested in a little bit more of the blog talk, um, Dr. Ed Thalman, who used to work here at Dan before he passed away, wrote an article in 1999 on this very issue, and it is a wonderful uh, treatise on this subject. Psychiatric issues. This can be a tricky issue to talk about because sometimes these concerns are difficult to diagnose or to figure out. 
The primary concern that we have is whether or not there's an impairment of judgment or awareness. You can imagine when you're diving, if your judgment or awareness are impeded, you have phobias, fear, you deal with stress poorly, or you have suicidal thoughts. These are all issues that don't really lend themselves to safe diving. And the impact of those behavior issues don't just affect the individual, they may affect all of the divers in the water or anybody who is trying to lend assistance. Antidepressant medications are used very commonly in this country. In fact, they are one of the most commonly prescribed medications. Of that group, serotonin selective reuptake inhibitors, also known as SSRIs, are by far the most common type of these medications and they're considered safe to go diving with. I want to stress, however, that the, again, the medication is one issue. The underlying psychological concerns are another. Wellbutrin, or bupropion, used for depression. It is also under the brand name Zyban, which is used for smoking cessation help, is also a commonly used antidepressant medication. When this medication first came out, there were concerns about seizure risk. Based upon the research and studies that we have seen and the expert consultation that we have also received, at doses less than 300 milligrams a day, seizure concerns are really not an issue. Last in this group, I'm going to say a few words about lithium. Lithium is a mood stabilizing medication commonly used in conjunction with other medications and definitely not a first-line medication. Lithium is released or removed from the body by the kidneys and so issues like dehydration raise the potential of lithium toxicity. And lithium has got a very narrow therapeutic range which means that trying to get to that sweet spot where the medication is effective but not toxic is a difficult place to get to. When someone has dehydration, it narrows that window even further. And adequate dehydration in the case of lithium use can cause acute toxicity, which is a seizure. And as I've said before, seizures under the water are most likely going to be associated with a fatality. Sleep aids are used very frequently amongst divers who travel or are on liveaboards. Examples of this class include Zolpidem and Zoloplan which are the brand names of Ambien or Sonata. These have short half-lives, meaning that they have short effective times and may impact people's ability to reason and problem solve. In contrast, Rosirum or Romelation is a medication which impacts melatonin in the body. This is not a sedating medication. It helps to induce sleep and doesn't impact judgment or uh, problem solving ability. It is a nice alternative if people are traveling and diving. On the whole, the goal would be to use the minimum dose possible and take it as early as possible so by the next day, the effects of these medications are non-existent. Next is antibiotics. Dan has no evidence that antibiotic use has caused any problems when diving. But the underlying question has to be, why are they taking the antibiotic? Issues like upper respiratory tract infections, urinary tract infections, skin infections, etc., are all reasons to probably postpone diving until those issues are resolved. A unique exception to this might be malaria prevention or prophylaxis. Some of the medications that are used are antibiotics, and the antibiotics themselves are pretty safe so long as the underlying issue for which they're being used is consistent with diving. Common side effects of antibiotics would include diarrhea and for some photosensitivity, meaning people have higher sensitivity to sun and are more likely to sunburn. A specific medication that is used for malaria prophylaxis is mefloquine or larium. This medication is a potential for lots of unpleasant side effects including horrible dreams and some psychotic thoughts and generally is not recommended if you're diving. If you are going to an area that requires mefloquine use because other medications uh, are not going to be effective, it's important that you try this medication before you travel so that you know how it affects you.
cancer. One of the medications that is used in some forms of cancer is bleomycin. Within the hyperbaric medicine world, bleomycin has created a certain degree of anxiety because it may predispose people to some bad side effects one in particular being pulmonary fibrosis. If people are exposed to high levels of oxygen after taking the medication. Based upon the available information and workshops, it looks like if people are off this medication for a year or more, their chances of pulmonary fibrosis approach zero and are therefore safe to dive with. Another concern that we get here at Dan, not infrequently, is people who have Mediports or relatively permanent ports for which medications can be injected. These ports are commonly in the chest and enter through the large vessels and directly into the heart. On the whole, since these ports are under the skin, they are very safe to go diving with so long as the underlying medical condition for which the port was in placed, was placed in the first place is consistent with safe diving. The next class of medications involves the treatment of erectile dysfunction. These are commonly used medications amongst the general population and divers as well. Examples of this are medications like sildenafil or Viagra or Tadalafil Cialis. Each one of these medications has a very similar action but their duration of action is different. For diving because of the potential concern for seizures with these pills we recommend the use of a shorter half-life medication like sildenafil or Viagra versus the longer half-life of Cialis. Many people ask us about the use of multiple medications. All right, so we've talked about one, but what if I'm on three or four or ten? There's not much data to support or reject any kind of medication cocktail on its own. What is Again, an underlying importance is the underlying medical conditions for which you're taking all these medications and whether or not you have side effects which would limit your ability to dive safely. In the big picture, it's important to remember that diving is voluntary. We do it because we love it and we want to do it. If it's a bad day or we shouldn't be in the water because we're not feeling well, it's best to avoid diving and find another activity for which we can derive fun and enjoy the people that we're with. It's important that we have an adequate physical fitness and capacity to match the environment within which we're diving and to remember that the impact of our inability to take care of ourselves may involve other people that are in the water with us. We've talked about the potential impacts of particular medications. Of, on the whole, the big ones that we have the most concern about are those that impact judgment and physical ability and the ability to make good decisions under stress. We have also talked about people's underlying psychological condition or mental status and their ability or lack thereof to make good decisions or handle stress. On the whole, we would recommend that a diving candidate be alert, free from distraction, and capable of self-care and assisting others. That concludes my talk for today. I appreciate your attention and thank you very much for your support of the Divers Alert Network.